So here's actually, here's a better question. Or here's something to, I think is worth like saying very blatantly and boldly to the listeners slash watchers. How do you make a living? Right. Just, yeah. Like how right. do you make a living? Right. Okay. I don't make a living as a filmmaker and I have only received maybe a handful of checks for other things, but not a director. I've never been paid to as a director. Even when I accept, accept jobs um, for other people's project is usually uh, free because either I, I really believe in that person's work or I understand how hard it is to raise money. And especially if you're a person of color, I'm not going to talk money with you because I know that unless you come up with it, I have the budget to pay you. Um, Cause I just, I just know how hard it is. I'm just trying to be somebody Hello everyone, it's me, Halise, endeavoring to persevere as always back with another trying to be somebody episode for you. In today's episode, I have Chin Wei on. She is a local Austin filmmaker who has produced at this point four short films, four narrative short films. I really wanted to have Chin Wei on the podcast because as y'all may or may not know, I am currently trying to produce a web series with my friend and fellow creative Evelyn from the internets. I'm not gonna lie to y'all, hopping into narrative filmmaking from the sort of content creation, corporate video production sphere that I've lived in for the bulk of my career. I think I bit off a bit more than I could chew. But at the time of recording this podcast episode, we hadn't yet filmed the pilot and now we officially have and are in post-production on it. So I really wanted to talk to Chin Wei and focus on some of the issues and concerns I see around black women in the film making industry and why there aren't as many of us as there probably should be. So in this episode, yeah, Chen Wei and I are gonna talk pretty candidly about filmmaking, the struggles of it, especially coming at it from a BIPOC space. And then also we're gonna talk about some of her projects that she has in the works. So yeah, I'm just so excited for y'all to listen slash watch this podcast episode with Chen Wei. A quick trigger warning though, before we get into it, we do discuss some ideas around suicide. So keep that in mind as we go through this episode, maybe sit this one out if you need to. And with that, Let's get into it. Today, I have Chin Wei on the podcast. Um, she is a filmmaker, indie filmmaker based currently in Austin, Texas. And one of her most recent accolades, I would say, is her latest film, short film, Love Bites, which is on Issa Rae Presents channel. I will link it in the show notes for y'all to go check it out. Um, it's a really awesome short film. And so I really wanted to have her on the podcast to talk about indie filmmaking. Thank you for having me. This is such a pleasure. I came to Austin in 2013 to go to school at St. Edward's, just finish out my undergrad career. And I came to Austin. I picked out Austin out of... Um, um, a bunch of school because um, of the growing in the film in industry. Though I didn't go to film school, I used my um, experience at St. Edward to start and launch a student-run TV station. And uh, that like kind of like helped me hone my skills and like being a leader. Uh, can I curse in here? Yeah, you could do that. <laughs> that whole experience, I, I ate a lot of shit because it just hard, it's hard work, um, especially when I try to get a lot of students to like basically do the work. Like everyone loves the idea of having a TV show, but no one likes to really like execute the plan. So being the head of that and then trying to be on top of everybody. And then also helping people learn how to like the, 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 the rules of production was also a challenge because I was also learning, but I also like, I was retaining information faster than the other people that I'm learning with. Uh, so it taught me a lot of patience. I got recognized by Study Break magazine. Uh, Study Break basically just like, is basically like people magazine for college college students. And so I was uh, recognized on their, uh, at the cover, I was on the cover of their magazine called like, uh, they called me the next big thing. And just getting that accolade really like was like, oh, okay. In 2014, they said I'm the next big thing. Um, let me see how, what I can do with this now. And then I started taking like filmmaking a lot more seriously. And so I got started writing. I think 2014, I wrote Love Bites, but, but it wasn't like the 
the version that you saw now, but I just kept like working on it and giving different drafts and um, the ideas kept turning to one another idea. So from 2014 to basically 2018 is when I was working on Love Bites and God Love Bites moving forward. Um, so in 2018 is when I did my uh, first crowdfund and to be transparent, it wasn't successful. Um, but one thing I can say, though, um, I definitely caught people's attention of knowing that I have a good eye for direction. I had already directed a concept trailer. This concept trailer didn't really have like dialogues or anything like that, but it was more like the vibes. I was able to get the money together. So I didn't get it through um, uh, crowdfunding because a lot of the crowdfunding is basically your network of friends and family. And if your network of friends and family are not um, saying like in a certain socioeconomic status bracket that like has that disposable income to like just help out, yeah. um, you're kind of a shit out of luck. So, but what happened what, with that when it when it failed, technically, well, it did fail. Uh, um, there were some people who saw that and they reached out to me and told me about local grants that I didn't, I wasn't privy to. I mean, I was aware about the city, the city grants, but the way they worded things made it seem like filmmakers were out of the conversation. It was more like visual artists, um, dancers, theater, theater uh, performers. But filmmakers were not like it didn't spell out a filmmaker. So I never even considered uh, looking at the city grants. And because that person told, like put me on game on um, the type of avenues, sourcing avenues that we can tap into, I was able to get Love Bites uh, made. So Love Bites is not my first short film. It's like my my third short film, but it's like first really public uh, short film I let out. Up to that point, I was able. I had a couple of experiences and. I knew that Love Bites was so special that I wanted to make sure it was right and I was in the right position. Um, so once um, we shot, I, sh uh, I shot it uh, and was ready for a festival run. 2020 happened. We all know what happens in 2020. Awesome Film Society um, had a showcase um, with South by Southwest and I got into that. And so there was supposed to premiere um, during South by Southwest and we didn't, we kind of lost that opportunity. However, we did release it to the public uh, in that theater. Um, so like 2020 de definitely changed like the trajectory of where I thought Love Bites would go. Like the festivals either got canceled or we just didn't get into the festival because they probably like reduced the size of how many people they let in. I was like, let me, I like, what, do I, what, what is there to lose? Let me just like find a general email for Issa Rae and just send her an email and just tell, say, hey, watch my, like watch this movie. <laughs> <laughs> And it worked. And then I got a response like in three weeks later from her team saying, Issa saw this. She really liked it. Uh, would you like to um, cop on a meeting? See if you want to be part of Sword Film Sunday. Yeah. And this is a program she was having and she has. Uh, normally, like I think at the beginning, the initial idea is like every Sunday there's a new short film, but there's it didn't come out as uh, frequently. And I and part of the plan of the package deal was to have Love Bites be the new relaunch of, um, of it. So... I was really excited to hear that, like that um, somebody who I look up to was like immediately like, I love it. Uh, you gave me the inspiration to start this thing over again. So um, yeah, that was just, that was kind of like where I am now. Because of Issa, I was able to get Love Bites, I mean, sorry, Elephant on the ground uh, going. Um, Elephant is my current um, sh short film that I'm in post-production for. Because I had more eyes on me and people were like, okay, like they're like people are now leaning in and trying to figure out like, who is this person? Yeah. And um, certain things like started happening, like Austin Chronicle was like curious about me. And then they um, um, wrote an article on me. But then like, somebody in the Austin Chronicle nominated me as like the best filmmaker, like alongside Richard Linklater. So like, I, I really, I credit like where the momentum is to Issa Rae. And she, we have, I've never met her, <laughs> but she, she's done a wonder to my life right now. That's really fascinating because it's, um, it's like, so to me, I, when I watched Love Bites, um, I saw, I like, I one, I loved how you used the cinematography to show this woman's like inner struggle, inner turmoil with the relationship, mm -hmm. um, and all the different like the way you used color in the piece. Really loved that, and just kind of going back in like, so Love Bites is around, I think it's around thirteen ish mm -hmm. minutes of of content, if you will. Can you talk a little bit about like? the bare bones sort of like production of it. So like how many days did y'all shoot mm -hmm. at the, and once you kind of had wrapped everything up and gotten it to a place where you wanted, what was sort of the final like total cost, if you will, just to give people an idea of like when they go to watch the film mm -hmm. and are listening to this, they can kind of figure out like, oh, okay. So here's what that 
is. You know what I mean? Yeah. Okay. Let's see. To go into production, um, we went for, for three days. It was somewhere around $8,000 or maybe a, a little over $8,000, but under $9,000. So we have to pay to our main cast and our crew. For that amount of money, I was able to get a lot of friend discounts uh, to be able to accomplish um, the look that I'm, I was going for. Then post-production, was I would say I paid my um, colorist a thousand dollars. I remember that. I'm in the, I'm the editor, so no cost to that. Sound mix and composer is tricky because we got a favor. Somebody was willing to work for free for a bit. It turned out that it was more like they didn't have the experience when they wanted experience, so they was gonna fake it to make it kind of situation. Yeah. I was under the impression that they were experienced and they just wanted like give me do me the favor. <laughs> yeah, of, actually they were doing. <laughs> Uh, basically, Love Bites was the testing ground. And so we were like on the 11th hour. Part of our grant uh, requirements is to hold a public uh, exhibition of um, what we're working on. It could be anything. And I chose to have a public screening. And we were down to five days until the public screening. And I was like, oh, well, I have to like find a new sound person. Uh, so they um, charged me $500 to basically uh, do all the type of like sound mix and sound um, design. Um very minimum because he's like, well, like you can't be picky. I'm really proud that he was able to get that, uh, get it all together for uh, such a, a short amount of time. And maybe there's things I probably could change in the sound department. I know like uh, one of the feedback I got from the judges on uh, one of the festivals was like parts of the movie was too soft. And I was like, oh, I don't, <laughs> what can I do? <laughs> Turn up your volume. I don't know. <laughs> Um, so I think the grand total of, I remember it was something like 15,000, but I also remember seeing the total budget being like 20,000 because once we did a festival run, I learned the hugest lesson about fest, uh, submitting for a festival. It's like, you don't have to submit to every festival. Yeah. <laughs> I really, I had to be more strategic about that because it adds up. And yeah. uh, by the time I was done, I think we were close to $2,000 in submission fee. And that was a waste of really two thousand dollars because 2020 happened and half like literally 80 percent of them couldn't even hold, hold the festival the way we we envisioned so yeah hey everyone i hope you're really enjoying this candid conversation with chin Wei about being a black filmmaker wherever you're watching this podcast right now please uh engage with it in the comments down below liking sharing that really helps algorithmically for this podcast to be successful Likewise, if you're listening to this podcast, wherever you are listening, please rate it there. Five stars is preferred, but we always appreciate constructive criticism. So thank you in advance for that. The next thing you can do, if you want to take it a step further to keep this podcast going, consider joining the Patreon, patreon.com slash Halise. There you get early access to these podcast episodes, as well as private weekly vlogs from me about running a production company, everything I've got going on in the background across all the things that StumbleWell does. And with that, let's get back to Chinwe. Why don't you tell the world that you have a movie? You do yourself a disservice by um, having it take too long for the public to see it. You know, I've yeah. been a lot of projects where, you know, like I worked on it actually five years ago and it's now coming out. It was like, and it was a short film. It's like, why does it take five years for a short film to come out? I love by the majority of it was self-funded because um, I wasn't getting the grants immediately because they, I didn't have anything else to reference for them. Like a lot yeah. of these big um, grants, um, they're going to give it to somebody who has more of a, like a veteran in the industry than like a newcomer. Yeah. So a lot of it was self funded. I don't know. I think like twelve thousand dollars out of my own pocket. I don't know where the money came from, but it somehow it came out of my pocket. It's like, how am I going to find that amount money? And um, so I tried it again with uh, another crowdfund, and I think it's going to be my last crowdfund because it's just because um, you don't want to keep trying to deplete the same um, source, which yeah. is friends and family. This time, I would say that our crowdfund was successful, so I'm happy to say report that. <laughs> I think, and that's, that's something that's actually been interesting for me. I know a lot of like, when I talk to filmmakers, they'll mention things like, yeah, you know, I'm in the process of crowdfunding my film or this and that and whatever. Um, and the first thing I often think is like, if you're a filmmaker and you're going to be doing crowdfunding pretty consistently, why not have an online presence? Why not have some kind of YouTube channel or something like that, where you can put a lot of content. So that way you can start to broaden that breadth of reach, you know, something that was really a struggle for me coming into, you know, I, for those of y'all who do or don't know, I went to film school and did the whole, like, 
UTLA thing and all that kind of stuff. So I went to LA for a little while. And it wasn't until I was in LA that I actually realized how my colleagues, my friends who were around my same age, 20, 21, were making these short films and getting them funded. Because I was just like, where is this money coming from? You know? Mm -hmm. And it wasn't until I was in LA that I realized like, oh, (laughs) I'm poor compared to (laughs) y'all. That's what's happening. <laughs> and, it, yep. you know, and realizing like how many of them actually had rich uncles, you know what I mean? Or rich cousins or rich moms and dads. And so can you talk a little bit about like how you've navigated this whole like funding your own films route? Uh-huh. Yeah, that realization is real because I realized that we're, we're in love bites and it was, almost put me in a depression uh, because, I mean, I obviously knew that I wasn't like, I was going to have the same path as my counterparts. And a lot of my counterparts were, uh, are white. Um, but I, it didn't hit me that like one of the reasons why they were always constantly turning out content and being able to make short films or being on people's set or like not only just being on set, being able to take like free labor, like they can yes. work for free yeah. is because they're, they have the privilege to do that. It didn't dawn on me until I had to like make my, like do my first crowdfund. I was like, so I had, I, I've talked to people who uh, were successful in a crowdfund and they casually said $15,000. Yeah, that, that's that's doable. And I was freaking out. I was like, $15,000? That's a lot of money. So, yeah. but, 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 their, but their confidence in that amount. So I was like, oh, I can do it then. So I aimed for $15,000 and it slowly told me like, no, no, you can't do that. You can't ask for that much money because you don't know that many people who can give you $15,000 to make a movie. Yeah. And, um, so yeah, I, I definitely, I remember the feeling of despair um, when it dawned on me that this is just going to be a lot harder than I thought. I knew, I, th- I thought it was going to be like, the, the, hard, the hard part was like, once I'm in the industry and then getting the no's about race and all that stuff, I didn't know if the before even getting to um, the plate <laughs> that uh, it was going to be hard. So here's actually, here's a better question. Or here's something to, I think is worth like saying very blatantly and boldly to the listeners slash watchers. How do you make a living? Right. Just, yeah. Like how right. do you make a living? Right. Okay. I don't make a living as a filmmaker and I have only received maybe a handful of checks for other things, but not a director. I've never been paid to as a director. Even when I accept, te- accept jobs um, for other people's project is usually uh, free because either I, I really believe in that person's work or I understand how hard it is to raise money. And especially if you're a person of color, I'm not going to talk money with you because I know that unless you come up with it, I have the budget to pay you. Um Cause I just, I just know how hard it is. So in my, um, elephants, I think a lot of people thought I had a lot of money uh, with that project. And I, people came up, came up with me with certain, certain price tags. And I was like, what? Nef- this is not a Netflix funded uh, film. Like, what are you talking about? Like, like I had this one quote for like a $1,500 day rate. And I go like, what is this? Like, who do you think I am? Uh, I wasn't paying people dirt. I definitely was compensating them. But it, it was a, another new barrier, knowing that like the type of people I want to work with, we, we started the same trenches because we were yeah. all, like a couple of couple of years ago, we were all work, like working for free as PAs, whatever. And then they just they kept working, and I did it. I did it because I had a day job, and my day job I work. Um, I guess I won't say who I, where I work, but I work in corporate America as my day job. And by night, I I'm either writing or just figuring out um, figuring out how to progress my career in. Um, in the film industry, okay, you're doing this because you love me and you love the project, and that's why we are. Uh, I'm paying you a normal uh, indie rate, not um, a Netflix funded <laughs> backed film set. <laughs> well, it's, it's also hard because I remember, I actually remember you and I met um, because I was so similarly to them. I was working in a video agency. That was how I was making a full time living, and then I remember. It, you know, if you remember this too, but you reached out to me about Love Bites and you were like, I'm looking for a producer for this project. And yeah. even I, when I met with you, I had read the script and was like, yeah, this is really cool. I would like it. I didn't even get, have the right mindset to work with you on the project. Cause yeah. I remember my mindset was very corporate and mm-hmm. like, I think my immediate thought was, so what's your budget? Mm-hmm. And I came at it very much from corporate producer land, which is, yes. People have some sort of budget. 
Mm-hmm. And then you're like, here's what, as the producer, here's what I can do for you with that. Yeah. And, you know, like, the budget, and I remember you were like, the budget is, <laughs> and I was like, doesn't compute. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I know. I definitely remember that because I was like part of the early stages of me realizing I am not on the same playing field as a lot of people because, um, a, a, like for me, when I, uh, uh, I was reaching out to the producer to help me raise the money not uh, me coming with or with an X amount of money. So one, I think um, I think in the future probably is supposed to like I itemize the budget and then see how we can raise the money. But even that, even for elephants, I hired somebody to um, a line producer basically to basically um, draft what a budget would be, and yeah. it was a it was a ridiculous amount. But I was like, all right, I don't think I'm going to be able to raise that money. Money, um, but it's good to have a reference point. Um, then I was looking for producers and then their whole point was, oh, you don't have the money. Oh, I, I guess I'm not a producer. I can't help you. And so call, call me when you have the money. And so I was like, yeah, what is this? So I guess I'm constantly always going to try to find money first before I hire a producer. <laughs> well, it's also just like, again, I think it really is about like the mindset. And I'm sure, you know, ironically, with the success of Love Bites, I think people often automatically assume that the success you get also brings revenue, which is not necessarily the case in filmmaking, you know, like that's, that's just not a thing. So it's like, while I'm sure Love Bites being with Issa Rae has been very helpful in regards to like more exposure, all of that, Mm -hmm. like financially, what has it done? You know what I mean? Yep. Yeah, that's like, <laughs> yeah, I, yeah. I think people thought I got like, uh, like maybe she like funded Elephant or something like that. Like it just, it's just funny. Like the way people were talking to me, approaching me with, I was like, what are you talking? No, I basically started from, I'm starting for, I'm starting over again. Every time I, yeah. I do a project, I start all over again. I have to prove myself all the time um, because that's just how the nature of, of this industry is. I think something else that is really worth mentioning, and this is, I think this is another reason why filmmaking is such a, rich person's game is that like and I think you know I know people feel however they feel about Walt Disney but he has like that quote of just like we don't make movies to make money we make money so we can make movies like yeah that's really what filmmaking is like you shouldn't for those of you who are maybe aspiring to be filmmakers but not even aspiring if you're out here filming stuff you're a filmmaker but for those of you who are you know, starting off in the trenches, trying to get, make a name for yourself. Just know that most of the projects that you're doing, especially if they're indie, are not going to make money. You need to go into it really wanting, just wanting to create something, wanting to tell an authentic story, whether it's narrative, documentary, whatever it is. And then, you know, be, be happy it exists in the world. And that's like, And that's like it. I remember hearing um, Matthew McConaughey. Oh. <laughs> Matthew, <laughs> no, he's. Uh, I mean, I, he's like he's he's fine. I, I don't yeah. know why I, I did. I don't know why I did that face. Um, I know why. I know why I did that face. But <laughs> so Matthew McConaughey has this uh, quote that he was um, saying while uh, while he's on his book tour, and he was trying to explain to his kid about uh, persistence in this industry. So he's like, remember, um, he was, so this kid, I don't know, I think I forgot the um, the word he used, but it was like a, a Portuguese word for, for dad. But he said, like, you remember when dad um, lost all that weight and couldn't eat and was like grumpy mm-hmm. and he like for a whole year, you like you were, he was so miserable. <laughs> uh, well, a year later, people within the industry, uh, his peers said he did a good job. And rewarded him with the Oscar. So that was his way of explaining. Um, sometimes you had to go through like the crappy things, like the long end game is like there's a reward at it, at, at the end of it. Um, and he was trying to teach him about like just like the patience of being in this industry. And I kind of like try to link it to like just is even though it was like from his acting world, but I try to link it into like just me being a filmmaker, any filmmaker, like, yeah, and I am spending a lot of money investing in my own product. But I'm yeah. not never going to ever make me money. And yeah. and I'm probably gonna do it repeat it like three more times, but hopefully not. Maybe one more time. Yeah. I'll never. <laughs> uh, but the whole goal is to 
it is a stepping stone for one thing or another. And whatever I made, like Love Bites, couldn't maybe I won't get that media reward that I thought I was going to get, which is like getting an agent and um, getting into the rooms of and pitching. Maybe that's not going to happen until like five, ten years after that. But it did. But it did happen. There was like there's now receipts of what I did to get to where I am. Um, and so nobody can ever say that I was an overnight success because great way to explain this industry of where like you're going to go through some shit and you're going to be uncomfortable and be unhappy for a really long time. And hopefully the reward, it outweighs the, um, the un- discomfort. Yeah. And like the discomfort is hopefully ideally temporary. I mean, I know for me, like, and I think it's also this thing too of, um, like you said, like nobody can say I'm an overnight success. I feel like that's so true, like for anyone in most industries or fields, like people that you're seeing right now, whether they're filmmakers, creatives, like across the, what is it, the spectrum, the gamut, if you will. um, And you think they're just like popping off right now. Like, sure, maybe there's very like epic growth in this moment. And that's how you've discovered them. But generally speaking, most people, if you go back and look through, whether it be their social media, whether it be their Vimeo, like whether it be whatever, Mm -hmm. they've been honing their craft and trying to work on their craft for years. Like, um, what is the saying? I think the saying is it takes 10 years to become an overnight sensation. Yes. (laughs) You know, and, and I don't know about you, but I know for me sometimes, like, don't get me wrong. I love it when people love the work I'm doing and like, you know, are into it and they're like, it's so cinematic, it's so pretty. I'm like, cool. At the same time, I'm also like, man, I hope this looks good. I've been doing this since I was like 16. You know, I hope I know how to light myself at this point. <laughs> yes. Speaking of, you look really good. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> but like, that's, it's like, oh man, it's just, you really got to want it. Like you really have to be in it for the long haul, for sure. So I know we've talked a little bit about Love Bites and you talked about like the financing side of it and looking into grants, city grants specifically. That's something that I still am like, right, that's a thing. The city cities invest in artists. You just have to find the money, you know. Um, but can you talk a little bit about uh, Elephant, this new project you're working on? Can you give people a little bit like what's it about, um, where you're at in the project, all that kind of stuff? Yeah, so Elephant is a short film. Um, It's going to be my fourth short film. It's inspired by a childhood event. While I was also in the process of getting Love Bites off off the ground, I was taking um, improv class. And a lot of that was to just get my mind off of uh, Love Bites because there was a lot of uh, setbacks that were happening. So I took a class. And during one of my class, there was a... um, uh, uh, the teacher said um, the the topic is sixth grade. He just like hit him, hit me with sixth grade. Everyone had their own thing, but mine was sixth grade. Tell me the most embarrassing thing you did in sixth grade. And I was like, the first thing I was like, oh. and then it was like the, quickly. I remember like I told, I remember telling my whole classmate, like in my classroom, that the um, a student is not going to show up because she ended her life. But the way I said it was in a different way. Mm-hmm. Um, and um, and then they're like, wait. Elab- elaborate. So then I tell the story and as I'm telling the story, I'm also so mortified that I'm going to tell the story because I thought that they're going to judge me because the way I, the way by context of it is like, it's almost like that is one weird, but also like n- not your fucking business to like tell people like talk about that stuff. So yeah. I was so nervous about how i um, telling the story. So I'm telling the story about like, yeah, so um, I met this girl and sometimes she has a habit of um, be a little dramatic. So I, when she told me one day that she wanted to end her life, um, I, and, and I just go, I go on this, um, and I interpret it as her just telling me, see, um, I'll see you next day. Like, see you next, see you tomorrow or something like that. I didn't take it seriously. But then like the next day when she kept, um, one, one next day when during roll call, cause we shared the same, um, homeroom, um, the teacher was calling, uh, calling her name and over and over again. And I just, out of, and I, out of sheer, like, I just wanted to end. And I, I said it very flat. I said, she's not going to show up because she killed herself. And then I just went back to my own thing. I told that, that that's a real version. Like that's about me in real life. So when I told yeah. that story, everybody kind of like, it was like, like, like how you, re, you re responded. Yeah. They, just, they just had like, their face was like, and then awkward laugh. Like there was like the, like just like feel the air. Uh, yeah. They just started laughing. 
And I was like, I know what I said. I wasn't funny. But like now the like people's response is just to like giggle because they're like, what just happened? And yeah. um, and then the story goes on. And um, I don't want to, I guess, spoil it too much because it, right, right. it is now part of the um the movie, but it goes on that she does show up, and that's that is um that's part of the that's the premise. And then like how this how when she shows up, it now becomes like who's telling the truth about this conversation. And so that's where Elephant, um, you know, it comes from. It's come from this real life event that happened. And then I um, banded on it on giving giving a little bit of layer of uh, identity, um, secrecy, lies. Like, and I add, um, the mental health parts is kind of like intertwined with all that parts of the theme uh, with yeah. identity, public image and all that stuff. And I, um, because I remember how uh, they all laughed I decided to make it a dark comedy. I think for the movie, it works. It really works. And um, and I think um, one thing I would say, like the length is almost 20 minutes. Yeah. It flies by really fast because of the minimum coverage. I've learned, I've had that feedback when people watch it. They're like, they didn't feel like 20 minutes. I'm like, thank God. There's a lot of information that you're trying to piece together yeah. in, one, in one setup. Yeah. Um, so thank God. Because <laughs> that was something I was really nervous about. I was like, I do not want to make a movie that feels long. Like, like, yeah. Oh no, I totally get that. Um, especially so. Yeah. You said the script's like 20 pages. Yeah. Which is like you're getting into, you know. Yeah. That's like uh, like a show episode, essentially. Basically. And then you had you said you filmed it in four days again. Yeah. No. So like Love Life was three days. This is four days. Oh, four days. I wish okay. I had five days. And then and you're working with kids. And because you're working with kids for people who don't know if you're working with basically minors, um, there's a lot of laws and legalese around how long they can be on set, how long, not even like how long they can be on set, but also like how long they can actually be like working and you have to like give them a certain amount of breaks and like all this, there's a lot of stuff involved with it. And so like, this would already be hard if the cast were not minors and then, <laughs> and then you made the cast minors. And so, yeah, what you were filming like five pages a day. Yeah, basically. <laughs> Y'all. I'm, and we actually we actually wrap on time like we actually uh, wrap like three or four hours before uh, our end. <laughs> who was your producer? Like, so Kira e- Kira Ewa is my producer. She's a first time producer, and my first AD is Nathaniel um, Hendricks, and he he hired me to do to edit um, his fe- his first feature, and um, so that paycheck actually helped me fund um, the last. Uh, round for L- so love bites and mm-hmm. so there's like so he's really good uh, he was really good at k- keeping me um on top of like things and all but also helping me consolidate like ideas because i knew yeah. like i knew like the most important information i need to have um and i knew that i it would be a privilege or be a luxury to get more coverage yeah. but if we don't have the time we i mean we just can't we can't really push it so it's like Let's figure out how to get these oneers and how like how to fit all this information in one uh, in one frame. I know that's also something that I've found too in my career, and I'm and I feel like it's probably the same because I know that you've done a lot of editing too of stuff, mm-hmm. um, whether it be like other short films, and then I know you've edited a feature as well. Mm-hmm. Um, is that editors make really good directors? Yep, I think so too. Yeah, I really believe that because like there's been so many times where I've been the director on set for something and it's like, yeah, this is a cool shot. It's like pretty, all this kind of stuff. But it's like, I don't know what it is about editors when you've learned how to like have to endure cutting through things Mm -hmm. like and then when you're on set, you just know like this is not this is a waste of time to get this shot, you know? Like- I totally agree. We already went in knowing that we have minimal coverage. So when we have the luxury, minimal, like we have like the luxury of like adding a coverage here and there, mm-hmm. um, we actually end up not even using them. So I was like, I was right all along the whole time, like just keep moving and just go with that yeah. the minimal coverage we have. So like, yeah, like I, I, there was like this insert, a couple of inserts that actually like, I like in my first draft of editing, um, I put it into it and then like, I, um, I kept, and then, you know, I kept sitting on it. I was like, tell me about that insert. Just does seem like it just feels like it's throwing the flow off. Yeah. And then I, I sent it to a friend who I truly, I truly, uh, I value his, uh, his eye. I didn't tell him, I didn't prompt him. I was like, you know, maybe cut that. You don't need that. Yeah. I was like, Oh, thank God. So when I saw it, cause I was like, we, like, it's just so funny. Like the things that we thought, um, that would save the movie, like by just, Oh my God, we probably should, we probably get that coverage. 
Yeah, it didn't. It didn't um, help. I feel like the other like something I tell people who are interested in directing is like go edit stuff. Like go edit a lot of stuff first, so that way you can be a more efficient director. And when you are in those moments where somebody's throwing out an idea that can potentially change the way it feels or flows or something like that, you can be open to it. And know that you'll use it. You know what I mean? Like, mm. so you're not wasting the time. Because um, mm. similarly to you, I've been on sets where I did have a cut in mind. But then the DP would kind of say something like, I actually want to see if I can try this. Do we have time? This, that, you know, all that kind of stuff. And then when they, like, they would try it, I would say, you know what? As, let's do this because this is cool. And then in the next shot, make sure to get it this way. So that way I can use this now. Yes. You know I, mean? I definitely I definitely have that. uh conversation before I definitely upset that too like yeah. if there's a great idea like I talked to my script uh, supervisor and like hey uh keep this in mind now that now that we've introduced this angle like I want to um not only just keep that angle but like create a motivation for why we had that and um for the next shot yeah totally um so question I have, as we like wind down <laughs> oh so we're not going for the whole two hours <laughs> no, we're not gonna go I, for the whole two I hours we're like but... joe rogan this thing i was like oh that's so dope like we're gonna like talk for two hours oh my god that's so much talking that is so much talking that is so much talking um but yeah something like a question i have for you as someone who's now you know you're in i know you said you're in post-production on your fourth project now yeah what are what is something that you wish you had known about filmmaking that you would like want people that are listening slash watching to know? I think it seems very simple, but it really, um, make sure you're very precious about your team, the people you put on, um, your crew, the success of elephant and just being able to like get everything on time and just things communicating and flowing well, it's because i Pre- I had previous experiences where I f- started picking the type of people that I wanted and who were right for that role to yeah. help me. I had a great script supervisor. I think a lot of people, when they look for a script supervisor, or they don't even think about a script supervisor when they're um, putting um, putting a team together. The most basic thing that a script supervisor would do is just make sure there's continuity. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. But this specific script supervisor, I looked for. I like. I liked her because she she will set me aside and it's like, so since this happened. Let's think of a bigger picture in the, in the whole movie. Like, so it would like, say for instance, an actor made a motivation and chose it to like touch their hair the whole time, you know? Mm-hmm. And like when she, when she, when we're talking through him, like now she helped me now as a director thinking of like, how do I motivate that actor to un- like think about why they're touching their hair a lot? Because like actors are probably not even thinking about why they're touching their hair a lot. In her head, she's thinking like, I'm, she's trying to help me with piecing and editing. But actually the way she, the way we talk through it is all more about story. And, yeah. it's, and and that's a, that's not a like that's something that's that works for me. I don't know a lot of uh, directors probably like no your, your job is just basically fuck, look at it continuity. Don't talk to me. Yeah. Uh, so um, um, and also producers like make sure you have a producer who's a great communicator. Like mm-hmm. really knows how to communicate verbally and emotionally. Emotional communicator too. Mm-hmm. I witness people who um, they get a feedback from somebody else and they kind of sit on it and then they don't make the the change that needed. I think that my my biggest advice at this moment because of what I experienced and, and noticed the success I had with just with the production itself flowing is that I had the right person in each role and they were a phenomenal communicator. Um, they added something that I needed and I knew what I needed is somebody to help me with story, help me think about the bigger picture. Yeah, yeah. That makes so much sense. Like, And that's actually something I'm struggling with right now with... Um, with being a like with someone who's like with someone who's been online for a while now, a few years, and like being a one woman band with it all, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, now with hardly working, the show I'm working on with Evelyn, like great script. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Oh yeah, so those of y'all are watching, uh, Chin Wei was actually someone that we sent the scripts to to get feedback because we trusted her mm-hmm. eye and her storytelling style and all of that. But just talking to you about Love Bites and seeing all that, I was like, dang. I like In my mind, I'm going into that project. I had gone into it thinking, oh, I'll produce it myself. Like, I'll be the producer director on set and I'll star in it. You know, I mean, and, you know, Evelyn will be there. She can help like co-produce a little bit. It'll be fine. <laughs> and after talking to you, I was like, oh, no, I need to like a team. I need to, I need to sit down. <laughs> 
<laughs> I need to sit all the way down and start like, this is really good. Like that's a beautiful thing about filmmaking is it really does force you to collaborate with people, you yeah. know, and find the right people to collaborate with. What do you feel like are, if you're, if you're, so let's say you're an indie filmmaker, you're trying to get your project off the ground. I, th what are the four, I guess, roles aside from finding your actors and all that kind of stuff, what are the four roles you feel like an indie filmmaker should try to lock in and find first? Like if you don't hire anyone else, obviously like depending on the project, you're not going to have an AC an AD, like all this other stuff, but like, what are the four you think like key roles, like lock these down? and every independent film you're working on, try to at least have these four. Okay, uh, Okay. obviously camera, sound. Mm -hmm. Okay, so are we like saying the most basic or out outside the basic? Both, We can. Do, you can do both as well. Okay. I'll for basics uh, and then okay. uh, really Camera and sound, <laughs> so your DP and your sound, and I never skim on those mount. Like uh, pay them as much as you can, but without like breaking the bank, you know? Those okay. two, because th that ruins your movie if your sound is awful. So those yeah. two things, I say script advisor. I started as a script advisor and I say it's so important because it's not just continuity because most people don't pay it to continuity, but it's story continuity. And you mm -hmm. need somebody to help have it because your mind are probably off something else. Maybe you're so focused on this performance that you don't even think about what is the reason why you're trying to get that performance. Basically, a script advisor is a liaison between you, the director, and the editor. I work on other people's set as script advisor most of the time. I'm the afterthought. Script supervisor are always afterthought. I was like, oh, please. I, like any filmmaker, just never skim on that because it will save you on a long run of like, um, especially when you're thinking about coverage or like pickups. You, you would have had figured that out if you had somebody like the second person, your second brain um, yeah. um, for you. Uh, the AD, so the fourth one, having an AD because you want somebody to um, organize the flow of the production. Uh, fifth person, I will say, oh, mo oh my God, the most important thing Production designer. A production designer and a wardrobe person can be the same thing. Um, yeah. In an ideal world, you can uh, have them separate. In my film, I had a separate um, production designer because I've seen so many uh, short films. And um, I've actually talked to a friend who's um, he's a judge for um, one of the premier, one of the most prestigious film festivals. And he said, like, a lot of short films and a lot of indie filmmakers, they have the most boring aesthetic because they forget that just because you have a nice camera and looks good, like, fill it with something else. Like, I'm, like, right, right now I'm looking at your um, your screen. There's a warmth happening right now. Get behind you is a, um, is the, the plant. There's a, you have a brown, uh, so not brown, you have a gray couch. And there's a, a green um there's a green, what's it called? Blanket on there. There's like, there's like cohesive color scheme happening right now. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. if I were to film that, that's interesting. I've seen so many times people in movies, they'll, they'll probably have a blank white wall. They'll keep, have that wall. They have that uh, couch. They probably have nothing on the couch. Like, uh, it's just a blank canvas and just so boring. It's like, what am I looking at right now? It's also like nobody lives that way. No one lives that way. And yeah. so without a production designer and someone who's helping you elevate it and add, adding a color scheme, like you mentioned color, this is not information that the audience are going to pick up on, but me as a right. director, I want to be intentional about why I'm choosing these things. And yeah. I have a production designer helping with that. So that's my, um, ba the, the bare knuckle five people you definitely need. Yeah. And I think that's, that's a good, like, that's something I'm struggling with too right now is like debating, like, all right, how much am I willing to put in on production <laughs> design? How much am I willing to put in on wardrobe? All yeah. these things. But you're right. Even though it doesn't come off, like, I don't think you're going to, like most people who are watching films for entertainment purposes mm -hmm. aren't going to actually pay attention to things like, oh, there's red happening all the way through. Yeah. Okay. But on the whole, you realize like, I don't even know how to describe it. It's like yeah. a subconscious, like information being put into people. Absolutely. Because films are so visual, you know? Yeah, the visual language. We know immediately in our, well, in our culture, what red like, could be. Red could be power, red could be love, you know? Like Wes Anderson films, like, we all immediately recognize a Wes Anderson film because of his aesthetic. So it's like, you can either go as big as that or as, as subtle as like your room. Like your room. Like I think maybe you didn't int um, you were intentional about that, but it's the first thing I drew my mind because there was a cohesive balance. Like there's a like there's a gray and uh, green, and then I'm seeing like your shirt. It's like it's complementing the background. Like 
a production designer was gonna help. It's gonna help you make it make it like not as jarring. And then, then my background is like a little bit more like louder because of the like bold colors and maybe tells me tells you a little bit about myself and my yeah. the world I am in. Yeah, yeah. I mean that that helps so much to convey so much about characters and like the big thing you know with a YouTube video. I always tell people with a YouTube video, you want to say it and show it. You want to do both because it's yeah. YouTube. But mm-hmm. if you're making a film, ideally you want to show it. You know, mm. how can you show that your character may be manic? Well, mm. then the set is just, you know, they're, the room that they're in is a freaking mess. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, or how can you show that your character maybe is a doctor or something? Mm. Like, well, you have some scrubs on the floor as they're trying to get up to get ready for work. Like, you, there's so many things you can do. You can place in the frame the mise en scene. As they- <laughs> <laughs> Bye. All right, everyone, thank you so much for listening in on this discussion slash watching this discussion. I really feel like this topic is something that I just want to see more happen. So, you know, be the change or whatever. Check out Chen Wei on social media. Her film Elephant is now officially completed, I believe. All of her social media links will be down in the description or the show notes and also probably somewhere on screen as well if you are watching. And make sure to check out Elephant. You know, she ended up raising all the funding that she needed to, but hey, you're always raising funds. Um, I will link to the fundraising page for that as well. Take a look. And if you can, help her out, hook her up. You know what I'm saying? We gotta be out here. We gotta support each other. Amen? Amen. In the comments below, I really want to know what have been, if you are a BIPOC filmmaker, what have been some of your struggles, issues, hurdles with getting projects funded, getting things off the ground? Um, Let us know in the comments below. I just want to continue this conversation because I feel like as I continue to move up in my career and strive to try new things, this is something that, I don't know, I just want more vocabulary around discussing topics like this. So Again, I'm Halis, endeavoring to persevere as always, and this is the Trying to Be Somebody video podcast. I will see you in the next episode. Bye. I'm just trying to be somebody. Make a way, make a way, make a way. I'm just trying to be somebody. Trying to Be Somebody is a Stumblewell production produced and hosted by Halis. Our podcast and thumbnail cover art was designed by Timmy Coker. Our YouTube opening animation was designed by Evan Abrams. Our theme music was written and performed by Belief in Music and produced by Jay Ruckers. This podcast episode was edited by Christopher Narvaez and Holis Narvaez.